We all live in a digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust and to be trusted. We all despise control and desire freedom. We, we are all, all united. united. I would like to welcome my panelists and the audience to this special Day Zero event of uh, Internet Governance Forum titled Digitalization for the Use of AI in Public Administration. Our panel was kindly put together by the Polish Office of Competition and Consumer Protection and I want to congratulate them for inviting such a brilliant line of speakers. Um, Today, representatives of Polish and foreign public administration, academia and business will present their views on strengths and challenges of using AI in public institutions. I want to welcome everyone who are joining us here offline in Katowice. I would like to welcome everyone who joins us online, including our two of our speakers. And before we start, just on a technical note, this is a so-called silent room. So if you are here offline with us, you need to get a small, small earbud from uh, which, will, uh, which you will get at the door, because otherwise you won't be able to hear what we are talking about here. Um, you can also ask questions via dedicated chat uh, if you're joining us online and offline we'll try to make time for some questions from the audience. Without further ado, I would like to present our extra line, extra special line of panelists today. First of all, Mr. Tomasz Hrusny, who is the president of the Office of Competition and Consumer Protection in Poland. Good afternoon. Antoni Rytel, deputy director of GovTech Poland. Good afternoon, everyone. Grzegorz Łupkowski, who is a client partner executive and at Kindrill, one of the largest IT outsourcing services company in the world. Good afternoon. And online, Kate Brandt is joining us, who is Director of Data Science, Data Technology and Analytics Unit at the Competition Market Authority of the United Kingdom. Hello, Kate. I hope you can hear us. Hi, everyone. Yeah. Brilliant. And I want to welcome Dr. Urs Kasser, who is a Professor of Public Policy, Governance and Innovative Technology at TUM School of Social Sciences and Technology, Technical University of Munich. Hello, Urs. Hello, delighted to be here. It's fantastic that you could join us. Um, the next level digitalization is introducing AI to public institutions and please feel free to challenge this assent assessment. I want to start off with asking Tomek, the head of the Office of Competition and Consumer Protection in Poland, about the project he and his institution have been preparing and it's an AI powered app to better protect consumers. If you can tell us a little bit more about it and give us the background why have you decided to use AI in your space. Uh, in the Polish Office of uh, uh, Competition and Consumer Protection we we have uh, uh, our main branches are uh, and our main uh, uh, responsibilities are focused on competition and consumer protection so we have to bear in mind that we are focused not only on uh, uh, companies as usual and national competition authorities are but also on uh, consumer protection which is a huge challenge concerning this fast developing uh, uh, e-commerce, uh, big tech skills and uh, uh, the whole economy and the e economy that is uh, right now growing in a, a rapid scale and touch consumer behavior and consumer uh, 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 daily life. So we, uh, uh, we are absolutely focused on those uh, uh, activities that consumer has also in e-commerce, but we also uh, are uh, aware that uh, uh, as consumers, we uh, uh, we are not always safety in the in the net, and that there are also infringements that uh, uh, that touch and harm consumer interests, and that's why we are trying to uh, develop our skills, our uh, competences, and uh, uh, also new tools 
to uh, to act uh, in order to eliminate such uh, infringements right now we are absolutely aware also that uh, probably as all of us that these processes uh, that sh that we can observe concerning artificial intelligence concerning the development of big tech their possibilities to to enter new markets but also to use the data big data concerning consumers they give them a huge possibilities to develop even faster and as public administration we are less effective uh, uh, in uh, such uh, area of new technologies also because uh, a traditional both uh, NCA but also uh, agencies responsible for consumer protection are focused on law instead of focus on uh, uh, analyzing uh, algorithms and, uh, and the whole uh, internet space. So that's why we decided to uh, enter into new tools that can help us to eliminate infringement in illegal clauses in uh, different agreements. And it's also the first step, as we also have the register of some such clauses, it's more than seven uh, and a half thousand uh, different clauses that are illegal from uh, from the legal point of view and we want to use an AI to uh, to develop the knowledge about these different agreements and contract that are in the banking sector in the uh, in the different areas of people day to day life uh, in order to help us to in eliminate infringements also that we can uh, uh, we can find in the whole e-commerce not only in agreements that the consumer come to us and show us the papers and uh, ask us for the help uh, but also those agreements that we can find in the whole net. We also observe that such tools, and uh, it's also the way for us to develop new tools. Uh, and firstly, we want to understand the whole processes. Secondly, we want to uh, build. Uh, we all we want to build the knowledge how. AI can operate to eliminate infringements in consumer protection and in competition, as we know that it's the absolute future in the next decade, and those competitions, those competences should be absolutely in the public administration. So this new tool is probably the way we want to enter into AI, and we want to uh, use these tools. In, in uh, and uh, uh, of course uh, another tools to uh, for instance to to also build such um, uh, helping us uh, tools in public public procurement in uh, analyzing uh, different sig different signals that we have from both consumers and uh, com uh, and companies in order to be more and more efficient so correct me if I'm wrong, but this is the first time your office uh, uses AI. But I think it might be one or one of the first times that a public office in Poland will use AI in its work. It's for us. It's absolutely the first step, and of course we are traditionally connected to law, so it's highly difficult to build such tools and to understand so compli complex processes that we have. Of course, we are right now also developing new skills concerning uh, our cybersecurity and concerning our analytical skills to understand those processes, to to develop uh, those uh, tool, and also to use this knowledge concerning AI in different different other processes. Of course, we also cooperate with both European Commission and our colleagues from different member states. And we understand that uh, such tools and such knowledge is so complex that right now, usually companies that uh, use the uh, big, uh, uh, big tech, uh, from the big tech that use big data and use artificial uh, intelli uh, intelligence can use it in order to uh, to influence our behavior and usually it's uh, 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 sometimes it can be even against us and that's why we also have to keep up with the journalists to the, to help consumers and to help uh, the competition uh, to work uh, uh, in the right way mm -hmm. so in order to develop the tool you are using an uh, external contractor and antoni i would like to ask you because your institution, GovTech Poland, organized the whole selection process of choosing an external contractor for this project. And I know the whole process was um, 
somewhat innovative when it comes to Polish landscape. And could you tell us a little bit more about why was it special? Well, so first of all, of course, uh, the vast majority of the work was done by the colleagues from the Office of uh, Competition of Consumer Protection. We're just helping out uh, in our very limited capacity. But uh, this is one of perhaps uh, things that which are considered most paradoxical around uh, generally digitalization in, in, oh, as an overall process. Because you know, we, we keep talking about solutions, they're obviously very important, and policies and regulations. Uh, but then in the end, uh, we keep on spending the equivalent of half of our national budget every year on various forms of procurement. Uh, and at the same time, if this was a panel titled and uh, redesign, redefining design contest methodologies from the EU directive, probably we would A, not be having this panel in the first place, and B, if you were having this panel, we probably wouldn't have any uh, any of you joining us uh, today. Uh, and But in, in reality, I think, you know, all jokes aside, this is something which uh, does carry quite a lot of weight. So it's not just about what do we need because that's something which can be answered with help of specialists but if we do want to engage the private sector we cannot keep considering them um, you know, partners which work exactly like we do we, we as the public sector uh, in fact uh, you know, this is one of this was one of the cornerstones of, of overall GovTech in Poland was uh, a challenge of how to engage those companies, innovative startups, SMEs, uh, in a manner which is both competitive and be friendly for them. Uh, and we, you know, together with um, you know, hundreds really of different entities, ended up designing a, a methodology and then ended up being backed up by a digital tool, a, a platform, uh, which uh, happened to increase the participation rate of startups uh, or in general participation rates from about three, uh, three companies being an average uh, to about 22. And in fact, the contest you, you were referring to, Daniel, uh, exactly hit the average of, of 22 companies uh, you know, applying and submitting their works. Um, so, so we're very glad it ended up working out. Uh, in fact, uh, the winner ended up being a research institute uh, with uh, loads of experience in AI development. Um, but you know, something which which I encourage uh, maybe us here to discuss a bit more, or perhaps in another forum, is uh, you know to to really sort of not forget about this part of how do we end up choosing our partners, how do we end up choosing who we collaborate with, do we actually need all these papers, uh, do we actually need to have the process to go the process every step of the way, or how much can be done within the framework which we have. Because that's another common myth, and I'll, I'll be you know, ending ending it here. But one common myth which we kept fighting for ages, really, is that in order to do anything innovative in procurement, you need to change the law. And the thing is, you don't. Uh, there is a lot of leeway being given to uh, to tenders, to to bidders. Uh, all that's really needed is uh, for someone to gather those pieces together, streamline the process, and and make it. Uh, friendly for both parties and hopefully we manage to achieve it and uh, consumers from across the country will end up benefiting from this uh, and you know, again i couldn't thank enough uh, our partners from the office uh, for for giving it a go uh, hopefully it will end up successfully thank you so we've touched on a very fascinating and very important topic which is uh, how private business engages with public institutions. So Grzegorz, I would like to ask you next, what's your perspective on that in general? And uh, how, um, what do you think about the special approach that the office took when it comes to this project? Okay, thank you for the voice. Um, I'm simply, simply impressed. <laughs> yeah, that was, it was the first time we were attending such a different uh, approach to the procurement process in the public sector. We all get used to to the uh, public tenders when the uh, the ma majority of, uh, of the criteria are based upon the price itself. So very often when we compete for such a such a project, we 
we, we are touching the, the trade-off between uh, uh, about the price and the quality of the solution. In this particular case, the budget was pretty much defined. And this is very important uh, in such a project which get used to such modern uh, and new, brand new technologies like artificial intelligence. Uh, you know, when we have a well-defined, let's say, out-of-the-box solution, we can, let's say, I, I should put it to the, uh, to, to, to the vendors to compete for the price. But in this particular case, um, I'm impressed that, that, uh, uh, that the Office of Competition uh, and the Consumer Protection, together with GovTech, uh, have decided to, to put the quality as a primary criteria of selecting the vendor for implementing the solution. And this is really uh, a completely change of the game. I wish to have such competition, uh, you know, always. It's not always possible, I, I, don't, I understand. But in this case, where we have artificial intelligence, which is a very modern and new stuff, we are, let's say, talk about the uh, rather research and development program, and it's not something which we buy from the shelf. We have to develop the solution, we have to test it, and the result, finally, it's very much dependent on the involvement of the uh, of end user who have to teach the artificial intelligence how to read, analyze, and the result is very much dependent on the quality of training. So this is a process itself, and uh, actually the, the the project is. Uh, we have experience with with implementing artificial intelligence for the business, uh, where we are continuously developing, improving, and training the artificial intelligence system to be effective as we wish to. So, and the whole process here is really uh, a greatly designed. We were from the very beginning understanding what is a goal uh, office wants to achieve, how they want to achieve it, what is a, a goal. I, uh, I was reading, the, say, the requirements uh, uh, seeing that you know that, that they have done huge effort to understand what they can, uh, what they want to achieve from the artificial intelligence. Because artificial intelligence, it's not a tool; it's a system where the end users are working to together with the machines and learn from each other. And this is great also from the consumer perspective. Thank you very much. So now let's uh, move to London. Kate, I would be really keen to hear how, uh, what is your institution's approach? Because I know that you use external experts like the Polish office, but you also hire your own data scientists. Uh, could you tell us a little bit more about uh, the benefits of that kind of approach? Sure. So, excuse me. Um, so let me um, just start off with a little bit more of an introduction um, of kind of, you know, of my team and stuff. And so I'm a director of data science within the UK Competition and Markets Authority's um, Data Technology and Analytics Unit. It's a bit of a mouthful, but um, basically, um, so, so this new, what we call the data unit, is a team of about 35 or so data scientists, data engineers, uh, what we call data and technology insights officers, behavioral scientists and digital forensic specialists as well. So we kind of put all of those specialists all together into one sort of central team. It's about two and a half years old now. And I think it's the largest team of these sorts of data specialists in any consumer and competition agency in the world. Um, and one of the things we're doing is helping the CMA to be more efficient and effective across its remit. Um, we do that by building data science tools, data pipelines, gathering and analyzing large data sets that we're starting to now do more with some of our powers, and also providing technology insight, which is something that increasingly we're finding a lot of the case teams want to understand, you know, how AI works and how companies use it, that sort of thing. And it was set up because of the recognition from those, I think, at the top of the office that we're going to be increasingly needing these skills and functions to, to actually work in these complex digital markets that we're getting a lot more, you know, a lot more cases in that area. So I oversee um, data scientists who are building analytical tools for the CMA, 
but also um, a programme of work as well, sort of on the other side, I suppose, where we're trying to understand how businesses use algorithms and how that might harm consumers and lessen competition. And um, a very little bit of background on me as well. Um, so I am a data scientist by training, um, but before and before joining the CMA a couple of years ago, I also kind of built and led data science teams in central government in the UK. Um, and so that sort of included the kind of deployment of machine learning models and that sort of thing. Um, so, so, so coming back to your question, our approach is actually to do most things in-house. Um, I found, and this is not just my experience from the CMA, this is sort of a wider thing. I found that um, if, if, if you're bringing in external expertise, it's actually um, preferable to do it as bringing it in as a resource, I guess, where you've still got kind of more control of it rather than kind of commissioning out a piece of work. And I think the main reason for that is a lot of what you need to do in AI machine learning and um, what you need to understand is about the context actually and understanding the business and um, understanding where it's needed and why it's important. Um, and then the other big thing that always seems to come up is about the data. So it's understanding the organization's data and, um, and particularly actually the issues with the data that are not always that apparent. So people internally can often understand that better. Um, and also, of course, if you build the tools internally, then you've got the people who can understand that um, they can integrate with the existing tools that we've already got, provide ongoing advice and then um, can also kind of easily tweak things if you need them right in, internally to change those tools as, as they're kind of, as they're required, I suppose. So, so our general approach has actually been, yeah, to do things more in-house. And I know that's not something that's available to every, you know, every um, agency, um, but it's something that we've um, put a lot of effort, I guess, in and a lot of resource to, to putting in. Thank you very much, Kate. There were some really interesting remarks. Uh, Urs, you are one of the world's renowned authorities when it comes to artificial intelligence, and especially when it comes to AI use in public institutions. You advise governments on this issue. So I would like to hear you share your thoughts on some of the early lessons learned from early users by, of AI by governments around the world. Thank you very much. And your introduction is way too kind. I'm just uh, uh, learning about uh, this new technology as many others as well. Um, I've been really uh, part of a larger network of researchers um, tracking over the past couple of years, what are some of these early uses of AI based technologies in, in, in the public sector. And so most of the um, evidence so far is, is anecdotal and case study based. Um, and I'm happy maybe to share three quick thoughts or observations from that work. Um, and uh, uh, maybe it's also a little bit uh, taking two steps back. I think it fits uh, quite nicely um, to also um, the more concrete conversations we had about the uh, implementation uh, in the consumer protection space. So the first um, uh, observation is really about the value of strategy. I think um, even three years ago, um, the AI use in governments was, was mostly focused on pilots. And we just heard even in, in Poland, this is kind of first in some ways uh, using this specific application in the government context. In parallel, however, we've seen um, that several national governments, but also uh, increasingly at the city level, uh, have come up with comprehensive and systematic AI strategies. And I think that's something that's very valuable for a number of reasons. First and foremost, I think um, we've seen that such um, systematic approaches to the question of AI deployment um, uh, force some sort of a conversation and reflection why AI-based technologies should be <laughs> incorporated in the first place. And I think the panel made an excellent case uh, why um, in the consumer protection space there may be you know, a lot of, of uh, value to such a tool. But um, on the other hand, side, I think there have been also early pilots uh, where we've seen AI being adopted as something new and flashy, 
where it was not entirely clear what the actual value is, especially also from a citizen or demand side. And I think uh, strategies are a good way to have this conversation. Um, I think strategies, um, as opposed to just pilots, are also important because they allow and invite for a systematic approach um, to mapping the different risks and opportunities to track such experiences over time and also build towards a common repository of best practices and lessons learned. Um, and uh, above all, I would say they also provide uh, an important opportunity to um, include citizens in all these uh, uh, tricky and interesting questions and create really inclusive processes, whether it's uh, the procurement part you talked about or whether it's later on the accountability and transparency piece um, when uh, technology is adopted. So first observation is really we see shift from pilots to strategy. And I think there is a lot of value um, to learn from the pilots and build towards strategy. The second point is, uh, despite some sort of a turn to strategy, I, I feel, and we've heard it already, um, the biggest challenge is probably at the implementation level. So even if you get the strategy part right, um, I think governments are struggling uh, with, with a set of implementation challenges. Some of them are structural. At the technical level, um, Kate and others have pointed it out already, um, we may have um, a, a challenge to find high quality data sets. They are at times unequally distributed. Uh, interoperability is a challenge. The maintenance of data sets is a challenge. Uh, quite often it's one thing for a government to launch uh, a new AI tool, but then to maintain it over time may be much harder also in terms of financial resources and the like. But it's not only at the technical level, I think even more importantly, at the human level and the normative level, there are massive implementation challenges. Human level, we've already touched upon it when talking about doing things in-house or, or externally. Um, I'm worried about the information asymmetries and um, how can we build skills and competencies, competencies among the civil servants and make sure that um, the people working in government have the knowledge it was already mentioned during the panel, how to attract talent in, in a very competitive market, I think very important questions. And normatively, just as a last some sort of example of implementation challenge, it's awfully hard actually um, to translate some of the, let's say, ethics best practices into a concrete application, uh, uh, given that things are so uh, contextual, as I think Kate and others have pointed out. Um, what does transparency really mean in a meaningful way in a given sector? Uh, what does accountability mean? Lots of hard implementation questions. So second point being, yes, strategy matters, but even more so implementation. And the third and quick point is about the law of unintended consequences. I think um, AI uh, in the public sector in these early stages is already rich of examples where uh, governments have done a good job, go government officials have worked carefully to implement AI, but surprise, surprise, um, many things have happened that were not intentional or at times were even um, harmful. And I think one challenge there is that at times we're um, maybe overly focused on the technology and not understand that um, an intervention that uh, AI intervention may actually upset at the organizational or human level, uh, the equilibrium or the ecosystem in which um, uh, an organization operates. And so uh, we've seen um, examples where, you know, the technology worked good enough, but good enough was not good enough um, because you had downstream consequences where, for instance, additional burden was put on citizens or beneficiaries, supposed beneficiaries of the technology. Um, and the very final footnote to this um, problem, I think, is it becomes increasingly challenging to continuously evaluate AI-based interventions. Uh, I think contrary to earlier um, manifestations of e-government, the whole point about AI is that it, it leads to more automation and one and, and scalability. And one problem it seems is how can we real time monitor what the 
technology that we introduce is doing in the wild when it's no longer a controlled environment, how can we intervene at the right moment? If I say we, I mean from a public interest perspective, from a government perspective, uh, and course correct. So the question of iterative design, continuous recalibration, course corrections becomes a really important layer of infrastructure, I think, uh, governments have to build in addition to all the things uh, that have been mentioned. So I stop here, but, but thanks for giving me the opportunity to share a few uh, thoughts from that work um, that's uh, rather uh, collaborative and global. Thank you.